I heard Fred <coughs> say one time that now we have to in, we have to live up to the introductions. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you so much, Aaron. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Savannah. I promise it won't be the last. <laughs> you have somebody just to come down here for lunch. <laughs> no, but um, <laughs> but um, maybe 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 a, a great place to start is just maybe you could say a little bit more about your connection to the city and 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 how it how it operates within the this sort of amazing itinerary of your career. Well, I have to blame Rob Gibson for bringing me down here. <coughs> what was it, 25 years ago, Rob? <laughs> he said, man, can you come down here uh, and take some pictures for us, a uh, music festival down here? Yeah, man, I come down there. <laughs> we don't have much money. I'll pay you to come down here. <laughs> so, yeah. I've had, it's been an amazing run for 25 years and taken some great photographs and met some great people, a lot of great people, I'm still meeting them. And uh, it's been my pleasure to come here. I look forward to coming here all, all for a year, you know, just to be around, sitting around on the benches in Forsyth Park, looking at all the crazy people that come through there <laughs> on Saturday, you know. <laughs> so yeah, thank you guys for having me. How, I wanted to ask you just, because again, listening to Aaron, so it's Nashville, Memphis, Chicago, uh, New York, these, you know, Cuba, how, I, I guess, you know, we have this image in our heads of, of the sort of traveling journalistic photo photographer, you know, with, with the camera around his neck going from battleground to battleground, but, but, but how, how important has travel been not only in the after the in the aftermath of your you know really becoming a professional photographer if that's a, the right word but also because I always wonder if it's right to ever think about professional in relation to artists that's why I said it but but also even the the, the movements that you made you know growing up in childhood and adolescence how much has all of that movement shaped the work that you've done? Well, it's all interrelated. You know, those, those cities that you named, uh, Memphis and Chicago, those are two blues cities. So I grew up basically in the blues, you know, in uh, Memphis, you know, the blues was everywhere. You could go to Beale Street and see all these famous people, still famous, playing on the streets. So, and then there was a, a, a radio station, black radio station called WDIA, and they played R&B in the daytime, but they played blues all night. And on Sundays, they played gospel. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that station was on all the time, it was like 24-7. So I got to hear a lot of good music. And then I had a, a stepfather who was a jazz musician, Phineas Newborn Jr. And he's the, actually the one that brought me to uh, New York uh, to play with Count Basie, play opposite Count Basie at Birdland. So when I was like seven, eight, nine, I was hanging out in the, sh in the uh, clubs. And uh, all of that painted my, my existence in, in, in the arts and the culture. And it was all important, you know, going from one culture to the next. They were distinct cultures, like Memphis was different than Chicago, and New York was definitely different than both of them. Mm -hmm. So it was good to see the difference at an early age, too. The thing about travel, uh, growing up in the segregated South, you know, you you kind of you kind of mired, you stuck, you know. So I always wanted to know where this culture came from, the origins of it, what made it such a great culture. And I, early in the game, I wanted to go to West Africa, where the slaves came from, just to find out what importance the drum was to the co that culture, and. I found out that it, the drum was everything. You know, it was in every part of their existence, their, light, their, their home, their courts, their schools, you know, the drum. You heard the drums in the morning to go to school. You heard them when lunchtime came and you heard when school was over. They, somebody was playing the drums to let you know. And the courts the same way. Uh, <clears throat> when the king comes in, he's got his drummers behind him 
there were royal drummers in the court, and they were talking to him, and they were telling him, you're the king now, there are going to be kings after you, so watch what you do and watch what you say. And his drummers were co-signing that. Like, that's right, that's right, that's right. You know, they had their talking drums. And uh, all of that was important to, to, to witness. That's why they took the drum from the slaves, except in New Orleans, because people understood what the tones were. Drum was a tonal language. So uh, I wanted to see how the music was made in Africa and then how it got codified in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So that was my foray into uh, Cuba and the Cuban beat. Because uh, Jolly Roll Morton said that you didn't have the blues unless it had a, a Spanish tinge to it. <coughs> so we went to Cuba just to see what that Spanish tinge was and how it got incorporated in the music. And what happened to it, how it got codified in uh, New Orleans too, when it came to New Orleans. So all of this plays into what I've been doing all these years. I always love that term, Spanish tinge. Because <laughs> tinge is, it's like a, I usually associate that term with, with, with the visual. You, know, you, you see a tinge. So it's, it's amazing that a musician would have to make an appeal to a visual term in order to talk about what's essential in the music. And it, it raises this question of what the relationship is between sight and sound. Like, and it's playing out so beautifully in the show. There's a section called chromatic music. And it's like how, you know, chromatic also being a term that, that keeps shifting back and forth between music and, and the visual. How? So when you said those are blue cities, it made me want to ask, uh, are you a blues photographer? Can there be a blues <laughs> photographer? That's like saying, are you a jazz photographer? No, you know, and I, I would keep telling you, look, I'm not a jazz photographer. I'm just a photographer. You really want to pigeonhole you. Yeah. Uh, a blues photographer? No, I'm not a blues photographer, but I'm a blues listener. <laughs> I listen to the blues all the time. You know, Muddy Waters was like a hero. And growing up in Chicago, you could see these guys. You know, they were still living. They, you know, Muddy Waters had his Cadillac, so you could see, you knew. That's Muddy Waters going through the neighborhood, you know, stuff like that. So those were my heroes growing up, you know, blues musicians, Howlin' Wolf, yeah. you know, all these cats. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a correlation there. I don't know that you actually think about the correlation until much later than uh, when it's happening. It's just happening, you know, in your life. When you're walking around, you, you're talking to your family members, and you're constantly hearing this sound on the radio. So it's not that you're dissecting it with them, but they're telling you about it. You know, yeah. I had an uncle that uh, turned me on to jazz. His his name was Robert. He was kind of crazy. He came from the Korean War. I think he was affected. So he turned me on to Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker with Strings was the first album I heard. So he knew I was going to uh, New York with Phineas. So he said, man, you're going to see all these cats. You know, you're going to see Dizzy, and you're going to see Bird, and you're going to see Miles, and this, that, and that. And he would go into character to tell me <laughs> what they were like, you know, but he would go into their character. And uh, he was a show, <laughs> you know, so that was a show. Okay, you have to forgive me, everybody, but can I argue with you just a little? Yeah, yeah, sure, okay. sure, Cause, sure. Because I want to make an argument. It's, this is horrible. I'm, I'm going to make an argument for you as a blues photographer, but in this, okay, in okay. this way. <laughs> All right. I'll so, be, if you want me to be, I'll be a blues so, photographer. <laughs> because when you were talking about travel and movement, and, and you know, usually in the history, with, with, you know, Part of what it means to be black in the United States is that you come out of a history of displacement. And that displacement often never seems to end. It's always on the move. We, we, we're, we're itinerant, which, does, which doesn't militate against the fact that we are also stuck. So what does it mean to be stuck and moving all the time? And, and how does that play itself out in, in the art forms that we produce? The blues as a form is a, is a simple 
relatively static form that produces all this variety and movement and constant disruption and displacement within that form. And, and jazz t takes off from that. And, and your, ph your photographs move. There's movement in those photographs. And, and, and so what it, and blues musicians are these itinerant technicians, right? Like they, they, there's just nothing that they don't know about the instruments that they use, including their voice. Just like it doesn't feel like there's anything that you don't know about light and a camera and how those two things can be made to work together. And, and so for me to say you're a blues player, it's not a pigeonhole. I mean, I know other people might be trying to pigeonhole you when, <laughs> when they say mm -hmm. that. But to me, that's like this extraordinarily expansive formulation. Right. But it, the thing about it is like Robert Johnson was, like you say, he, he moved around, you know, but he, he moved up and down the Mississippi River. And he sang about it, you know, it was part of his whole oof, you know, th to sing about his experiences in a blues form. And I'm kind of in the Duke Ellington uh, vernacular of dressing the blues up in his finest, uh, finest clothes, you know. <laughs> that's, what his, that's what he said he did. I dressed the blues up in, in its finest uh, attire. So that's what I try to do in the photographs. I try to dress the blues up because we are a blues people, you know. Uh, who was that? Uh, Baraka that said that yeah. we blues yeah. people. And um, I'm constantly trying to show the best, like Roy DiCarolli. You know, he the first time I saw him, it was the first time I seen a photographer shoot with that kind of empathy for the people he loved. And I'm I'm trying to do that as well in music and in just the people I shoot. So I was thinking about that word a lot, empathy, because cause kind of it's in, uh, it's kind of in ill repute these days <laughs> amongst the folks that I find myself with a lot, you know, you sort of, a lot of academics try to outsmart themselves out of empathy, you know, and, and for a whole bunch of good reasons, right, because the notion is that empathy is this, usually this notion of it being a way for the person who feels empathy to make themselves feel better without doing anything to make the folks who are suffering feel better, right? But, um, but it strikes me that empathy is of, a, of another order than that. And it, and it kind of has to do with how the photographer not only seems to be in the, the photograph, but also invites us to be in the photograph. And we were thinking about talking about this a little bit earlier with regard to space and the difference between photography in general and, and your photography in particular and say like Renaissance painting and how how you make space, how you hold space, how you how you break space. What does he does he how does that have to do or if <laughs> does it have to do with empathy? Uh, I think you can attach empathy to the medium itself. You know, you can love the medium like a painter loves to paint, or a sculptor loves to sculpt. A photographer loves to take pictures, you know. I mean, there's the empathy there to uh, go out and try to find a, a, a great image. You know, and there are three things in photography great images take into consideration. The first is composition. The next is uh, the photographer, and the other is uh, how the how the, the form is balanced with the space. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of empathy there. <laughs> how the form no, is balanced good. with the space. There's, there's moments it was about four or five slides back with the young men just on the street, and I. When there's moments when I'm going through the gallery and I really feel like, uh, it's not just that I feel like, oh, I've been in a scene like that before or I've seen folks like that, I know those folks. There's, there's that too. But it's also this feeling like I'm in that photograph. <laughs> like I'm in, in it. Like the space, this, is, that what's on the wall has embraced me in a way. And I'm there with that, you know, and I, and so I feel those folks, you know, I feel their presence. 
You know, it's like uh, Rothko, this, this collector was asking Rothko, you know, well, how did you feel when you painted this? And Rothko, you know, he didn't, he didn't want to answer the, you know, he kept asking him, so he said, okay. So when I'm painting this, you know, I might be sad, you know, when I paint this, I hope that the people that come to see it understand that I'm sad and they bring their experiences to this painting like I brought my experience to the painting and we meet in the middle somewhere. And that's basically what I'm trying to do in photography. I'm trying to, I've had all these experiences and I, I, I hope that the person that comes to see the photograph understands and brings their experiences to understand what they're looking at. So in that respect, yes. <laughs> well, um, there's a great- I hope I'm answering these questions like no. you. Like you, you know, <laughs> you're such a heavy cat, man. I, you know, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't want to not be answering, you know, to your it's, qualification. It's, it's all good. It's, okay, it's, okay. I, all right, all right. for me, it's all good. I, I don't know about y'all, but I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Uh, oh, I remember the first time. Um, I feel like this is the third time that I've seen this show. Now, I didn't see it in Naples, in Naples right. but I saw it in the Phillips. But the first time was actually in Ruth Fine's apartment. Oh, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. And uh, it was a little slightly unedited. Right. Know? And and Ruth is a extraordinary, lovely person who, for some reason, wants to keep giving me credit for co-curating <laughs> this, but it's not true. You know, it's really not true. Well, it, just, even if you just co-sign what she said, you know, that, well, that's, that <laughs> that's was, curating to her. That was the easiest possible thing to do. But but I remember it's it, what's extraordinary is it's been going in this sort of ex way in which the space within which the photographs are seen is expanded. We, so her, you know, she's got like, I don't know, one, two bedroom apartment and all of these images and a whole lot more were in, in there, her yeah. apartment. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Phillips is a lot smaller than this gallery. Right. But what's kind of extraordinary to me is that the, the, the photographs, the images seem at home in all those spaces. It, they work in all those spaces. I don't even have a good question other than how, how do you do that? <laughs> you know, she, well, the thing is, you know, uh, we, we had, she had so many images to choose from. The stuff that didn't go in the show is a whole nother show, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so they, they're all in kind of the same order. Um, I mean, it just, you know, after a while, the show lives for itself. It's like birthing a baby or something, you know? After a while, you have to leave it alone and let it just live and breathe on its own. So that's kind of how it got organized. Mm -hmm. you know, but there's, this, there's, a, there's a great short story by Alice Walker called Everyday Use. And it's, really, it's about a kind of family dispute around a quilt. Right? Oh, and wow. you know how some folks, you know, people, you know, it's obviously it's long, long history black women making beautiful quilts. And, and over the course of the last 25 or 30 years, you know, the quilts have been recognized as works of art. Um, it's just that the quilts were made to be used every day, which is to say they were, they were made ultimately to, they were made both to pass down and also to decay, to fall apart. They had to fall apart underneath the hands of the people who were using them. And I guess what I'm saying is like, these photographs are, for me, they're for everyday. Like, in other words, they felt at home in Ruth's home because they feel like family photographs. And they feel at home in these galleries because they absolutely also feel like works of art. Works of art, yeah. And it's funny you say something about quilts. You know, I was growing up in, you know, in the, in the culture of African Americans, basically, definitely in rural areas and in Memphis, places like Memphis, everybody had a quilt. Mm -hmm. And you know, the material was left from you know old clothes or uh, overhauls or gabardines or this or that. You know, they put in a bag and then 
they brought out to make this quilt. And everybody, oh, this was Uncle John's. This was Sonny's uh, shirt. And this was that one. This was that baby's uh, blanket, you know. So when you have a quilt like that, you're living, you, you're living with those people, too. Yeah. And uh, I had the pleasure of going to G's Bend once, you know. You know G's Bend, you guys know about G's Bend quilts? I mean, they're just fantastic. And I went there to find this lady. Uh, is a German name, uh, Bergendorf or something like that. But I saw a print by hers, and they said, well, she's from G's Bend. And I didn't know anything about G's Bend, so I looked it up, and all this incredible stuff. And I found her mother. <laughs> and she had all of this. Uh, there's a whole thing in G's Bend about these women that make these quilts. And they go around the world. I didn't have enough money at the time to buy it. But I was there, and I met them. And I was just blown away by what they can do. Yeah. And how they, it, it comes right out of Africa, too. You know, all that stuff was uh, positioned, the way the place was positioned. You know, it was just stuck. Those people were stuck after slavery, and they just kept making these quilts. Yeah, it's like a, it's like like an archive that keeps you warm. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're living with those people. Yeah. And I was, I was thinking too. Um, you know, the the one of the other cool things that you know, just to just to say. I've always been one of those museum goers. Like I, I go through quick, <laughs> you know. Like right. I don't linger. I right, right, right. feel like I, you know, because I, I think I just get overwhelmed, you know, yeah. and I need to, to take a break, you know. Um, yeah, but you log everything in your memory, you know. I do when I go to museums. I go. I'm the same way. I go in fast and I look at everything, but I log, you know, some things. I stay for a while though. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, you, and then you get to go back. And then you, you know, can go back if you, know, you want to. Yeah. Minutes, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And I, and what I noticed going back this time was something that was especially happening. I mean, well, it happens in all of them now to me. But I was feeling like um, I felt like I was getting a much fuller, richer sense of of a kind of relation between your photography and painting. Not that you're trying to do what painting does, because you don't have to, but but rather because there were certain ways in which, like, um, like in the, I think if you can see it in all of these, but but you could really see it like in the one for me with the, with the the bus, the the tour bus. So there's this like kind of beautiful, sort of swath of red at the bottom, which is the color of the bus, and you see these faces, but what you see is almost like this kind of collage effect or, you know. Well, that's on purpose in that photograph. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to abstract the form like I think it's going into anyway, but it still has to be a photograph. Yeah. So I'm trying to give you the pigment coming into each other, and but I want to give you an X mark, marks the spot. So I put in people, recognizable forms, and oh, okay, that's a person right there. It's not just uh, abstract feeling, but there's a person right there, and people uh, identify with that. They don't really, I, I don't know how much they identify with the rest of the photograph, but oh, there's a person there. You know, so I'm trying to abstract the form, but still give you a person, so it's, a, it's still a photograph, yeah. and you're right about all that. There's <laughs> so much, there's so much detail, you know, it's like, there's this one experience where you st stand five minutes and you look, you get a sense of the overall composition. You come back next week and you see something in the corner, <laughs> you know. Or like Aaron was pointing out, oh, there's Frank's reflection, right, in 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 the bell of the horn. You know, I didn't see that, you know. And it's like, um, I, it, it makes me wonder. There's that formulation that the the photograph changes, it moves, and, and obviously what changes is that we see it differently, things, aspects of it that weren't there, or it seemed as if they weren't there before, all of a sudden they're there, they're, 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 they're present. And it, so it makes it this kind of cool thing, because you, you go and see the photograph a couple times, and it changes, and you realize that you, you've changed, too, as a viewer. 
Well, a good example of that is that uh, St. Patrick's Day parade where it just looks, I really wanted it to look like just paint, you know, just dabbled on like something like uh, Jackson Pollock may have done, dabbled on. But in that paint, you see all these soldiers marching, you know, and you don't see that unless you get up on it. So from a distance, it just looks like paint dabs, you know, like a palette knife and you, you've done a palette knife uh, painting. So you have to, along with what you're saying, you have to get up on it to see what's in the middle of those blossoms on the tree. See that? I love the, the, the philosophical, technical specificity of black speech. <laughs> black speech. <laughs> up on it. That's a technical <laughs> term. <laughs> you got to get up on it. Yeah. Well, That's you know, I, hey, look, I came yeah. from, yeah. when I came to New York, I, I spoke like I came right out of the alley in Memphis, you know, and, yeah. and people didn't know what I was talking about, you know. It was a whole nother vernacular. It was it was colloquial, and it's like uh, you say you just as well too. Mm -hmm. Like when, where I came from was you Welster. Yeah, you know <laughs> you <were>. it got. <laughs> but but look, art historical language. But you know, there's a big old book from Johns Hopkins, critical terms for art historical study. They ain't got all up in it. In there. You're right. They ain't, and, they ain't all and, up in it. They ain't all up in it. And, and art history suffers from this condition. You know? <laughs> and um, there's another all up in it. All up in it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And I, I actually think there's certain moments where, it, it, you know, it, it moves from up on it to all up in all it. All up in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so you've been, you've been dabbling, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I was thinking about it today, too, because I was like, you know how you go through the museum and usually maybe, f I don't know why I noticed it so distinctly today, but I kept seeing a little sign, please do not touch, you'll see. And I was like, usually I don't, I, you don't think I imagine they all, they, they usually have that or they have like a little line, but, but I realized that you, you have to tell people please do not touch <laughs> with your stuff because people want to touch it. Yeah. You, in you in invite there. touch. <laughs> Get There's in a, there, right? And, which is to say that you know, we start off talking about, um, you know, this relation between sound and music and, and your work. And then there's this question of movement, even a kind of choreography, a kind of dancing that occurs to me in the work. And sometimes, like in the Juneteenth photo, which I think is my favorite one, it, it, people you, are dancing. You should have told me. I would have I I, given I, you that one. That's <laughs> my... That's my I, it don't, you don't have to, because it's, it's, yeah, it's implanted it's in, it's in, there, it's in there. But, uh, but then there's also this kind of tactile element. This, it, it, it's, it's an amazing thing to me that a, that a medium, which is so specifically visual, it's still, your, in your work, all the senses are activated. It's hard to do, you know? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to practice at it. You got to be thinking about it. So I'm always thinking about the medium, you know, and it's in my head all the time. So <clears throat> even if I don't have a camera, I'm taking pictures all the time. Yeah. Damn, that looks like a picture. <laughs> Let me, I wish I had my camera. <laughs> okay, so, okay. Well, to, today, um, I feel really lucky because the last, I was saying before, I've had this experience of being able to visit studios of artists that I admire and also talk with folks, you know, read them talking about their practice and it makes it feel like the studio is really a sacred space. Um, like kind of more like church than church is half the time, you know. And at the same time it's also like a, a mechanic's garage or, you know, and, and I was thinking about how so I was asking about the studio and obviously the dark room, but when you said just now that you're taking pictures all the time, it's like, you just bring the studio with you. Yeah, right? bring you the know. studio, you know, uh, wherever I am, there's a studio. <laughs> That's yeah. the studio. Yeah. Uh, it's a class too, you know. Yeah. Wherever I am, it's a class. I'm breaking up space, you know, just automatic now, where in the beginning you had to really I mean, it's like a musician doing chords, you know, in the beginning you got to learn how to play your chords, but now 
after you learn, you know, you, it comes naturally. Yeah. So, yeah, same thing. No, Different it's days. A, one of my favorite musicians, actually, this great classical pianist named Glenn Gould. Oh yeah, that's and a bad dude. There's this. There's this. <laughs> he had some issues though. Uh, he had issues. <laughs> I mean, if you got deep, you probably got to have it. I mean, it I mean, just comes know, with the territory. But he. Monk, Bird Powell, all these yeah. guys. They had some issues. <laughs> but he, he talks about he had this breakthrough when he was like 11. He was practicing the piano, and they had a, a lady who would clean the house, and she really didn't care about him practicing, so <laughs> she would come in vacuuming <laughs> while he was trying to practice. And he said, and he had his breakthrough with the piano was when he couldn't hear himself play. Wow, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, and, and all of a sudden, it was, it was about this relationship to the instrument that had transcended, you know, the specific, you know, sort of sense that it was supposed to be connected to. So when you're up in here moving in space, and, you know, it's like. I'm sti I still have a camera. But yeah. I got a nice story, like what you're saying. And my stepfather had issues, you know. He had a lot of nervous breakdown. And he was in Bellevue a few times. And one time he was in Bellevue. Uh, he was playing the piano all the time. So all he wanted to do was play the piano. So he took the piano from him. So a friend of his came and brought him just a diagram of a keyboard. Mm -hmm. And he played that all the time. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. You know, you don't even need the instrument anymore you, because it's all up in here. Yeah. yeah, it actually reminds me of the story I heard great pianist Randy West to tell about uh, about Thelonious Monk. He said uh, Monk was, uh, he met Monk at a club one night and said, Mr. Monk, I really want to study with you. I really want to talk with you about, you know, harmony and these chords and everything. So Monk said, okay, come by the house. So he gets up early one morning, goes to Monk's apartment. Um, and Monk was sitting on the couch and he just sat on the couch next to Monk, didn't say anything. Monk didn't say anything. Time passed, <laughs> got to be about six o'clock in the evening. He says, well, Monk, well, Mr. Monk, I, I guess I better go. Monk was like, okay, good, come back tomorrow. <laughs> 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 he said, and Randy West said, and at that, he said, and later I realized that he was a Sufi master. He could teach without talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's what he didn't play that is just as important as what he played. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. There's a lot of stories about Monk. I, all kind of guys have told me stories about Monk. I'm about to lose track of time, and I don't, I don't know what, where we, we are at. If I know we want to have Q and A, some Q and A, yeah, Q yeah. and A. Anybody got questions out there? Yes, sir, Mr. Mr. McCullo, Jason Johnson. Oh, I want you to know that I'm taking the whole frame when I put the black border around it. Uh, I did that early in the career. Uh, you know, people were t telling me, yeah, but you got to crop this and you got to crop that. It's like Roy Crop, and his mantra was, if it's not in there, take it out, you know? So my mantra is, is if you can't work it out, work it in, you know? So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I, I crop in my head, so when I'm taking a picture, it's already, I already know what's going to be in the frame, and that's why I put that black border around it. I wish I could do it in color, too, <laughs> but I don't, I don't have, any, I have any say-so about printing the color. Oh yeah, I mean that's that's a conscious effort, you know. If it's in the photograph, it's a conscious effort. If it's blurry, I'm trying to make it blurry so that it uh, I emphasize the the uh, composition better, you know, the subject matter better 
with uh, blurring the background, you know. So that's all a conscious effort, yeah. But it's done automatically now, you know. I don't have to think that much about it. It, you know, it comes into play and then you notice that it's something to be taken a picture of. And that happens very quickly. Sometimes it happens and you don't take the picture and a couple of seconds go by and you say, damn, that was a picture. You know, <laughs> you, you know, and you see it in your mind, you're still seeing it in your mind and then you, that was a picture, you know, a good one. So that happens too. That's all I'm trying to do <laughs> is capture a narrative. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to tell a story all the time. You know, and I think those are the best photographs that do tell stories. De definitely. We haven't spoken enough <laughs> to, to be real clear about it. We need to speak some more. <laughs> we need one of these sessions. He, he, he's, his time is very uh, taken up by all the stuff he does. No, but I well, I'm thinking of one one thing I, in particular that was um, there's a great uh, photograph by Roy D. Carava called Sun and Shade, and uh, it's two little kids yeah. playing. He yeah. found this amazing. I mean, he saw he saw the composition, he saw the picture, and there's a kind of great sort of diagonal line. That you know, that creates this sort of, you know, dividing line between what's in the sun and the shade, and the two kids are playing for on either side of the dividing line, and it's it's a. I mean, it's just like a kind of. I mean, it, one of the things about it that I think is probably a. I feel like it's clearly the case with regard to. I feel like it's it's a fundamental thing in art, you know. Um, it, it just doesn't care about the distinction between abstraction and figuration. It just doesn't even care. Everything that you could imagine or want from abstraction, it has that, and it has the other two. And and I don't. And I think that most of the you know the stuff that we love, it be, you know it's it's in that it's in that place, but. Um, and then at a certain point, you know, you, you're just trying to describe it, you know, um, trying to, how do you describe everything that's, that's in there, but, um, yeah. You know, uh, that reminds me of a, a story about Roy. You know, I've seen it, I, I was, see, I, before I met him, I saw all of these images, you know, and I studied his work and I, I attached all of this philosophical stuff to each image, you know. And then I was in a gallery talk with him one time, and he broke down all of these <laughs> photographs. And it was so simple what he was saying, <laughs> you know, that was in his mind that it just blew me away. I was like, oh, man, you mean that's all you were thinking about? <laughs> when you took that picture? Bam! <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah, that happens, you know. So, like I said, you bring your experiences to it, brings his experiences to it, and you meet in the middle somewhere, hopefully. There's a, another question I saw over here. I think. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All up in it, yeah. I mean that's you know that that's hard to do too you know and that, that's a, that's a trick to that too you know uh, 
Yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm like a fly on the wall most of the time, you know. That, that's what I'm trying to convey, you know. Okay, I want you to see this like I see it, you know. But you see it a different way just anyway. Uh, so, but yeah, I'm in there, though. I'm up in it. <laughs> All up in it. Yes, sir. Well, the, the thing is, I shot color all of the time. I just didn't have the money to print it. So I always shot color with black and white. Sometimes I would have a camera with color in it and a camera with black and white in it. And whatever I was doing, I shot with both of them. But I could control the outcome of the black and white myself. You know, print it, uh, soup it, and then print it, contact, and see what I had, and then... Uh, Print it myself. That's why there's a, a lot more black and white than color. But I shot color all the time. And the thing about color is, you know, the world is colorful. You know, it's not just black and white. Black and white is, is nice, but the world is color. That's why I'm shooting just color now. I mean, I shot black and white for 40 years. I got tons of negatives that I haven't even printed yet. So, uh, I like shooting color. Uh, it's a whole nother language, too. You know, it's not the same language as black and white. You have to come at it, you know, it's like speaking English and Spanish or French, you know. You have to learn that language as well. Great one, Mr. Thompson. I love shooting uh, negative. I mean, that's what I shoot for myself. Uh, sometimes I shoot digital, but the thing about digital, the thing about the difference is you're wear in, in, in analog, you're wear to one ASA. You know, if you're shooting 400, that's what you're shooting, 400. In a digital, you can shoot, <laughs> you can shoot 400, and then the next frame you can hit 6,400. You know, <laughs> so it's a big advantage of shooting uh, digital photography. But I think if you're going to shoot photography, you need to have uh, a good foundation. And, and that good foundation comes from black and white and being wed to that one ASA. But if you're going to be a photographer, get wed to something. <laughs> something basic. <laughs> Thank Tail Fair. Thank Tail Fair. <laughs>